blob, terrifying, slimy, gooey life form, which dissolves and absorbs anyone it comes into contact with. The Blob. It tells the story of a strange meteor crash landing on Earth in a small town in which the meteor unleashes a blob creature who runs havoc, dissolving anyone and everything in its path. It may be a weird concept, but there are no boundaries as to how much havoc, destruction, and death the blob can cause. Hey guys, it's Minty here, and I am 17 years old. What? You don't believe me? You think I look nothing like a 17 year old, do you? Well now you know how I felt when I saw the original Blob movie and they were trying to pass Steve McQueen off as a teenager. I mean, come on, the dude looked 30 something. Okay, I know when they made the movie he was actually 28, but come on! That is not a high school student. The Blob has now terrified movie audiences in both 1958 and 1988, in the form of two Blob movies. The first movie has that real sort of sci-fi B-movie feel about it, and although it serves up high doses of camp, it's still a lot of fun. It tapped into the paranoia that seemed to be going around in the 1950s about the American way of life getting invaded by evil alien entities that are hell-bent on conquering and destroying. A paranoia that a lot of people put down to the political turmoil of the Cold War at that time. Then you get the 1980s remake, which is way more bloody and gruesome as hell, with much more of an emphasis on gore and body horror. And, well, what can I say? It's awesome! And dare I say it, in my opinion, more shocking and more memorable than the original. And still holds up today. The remake feels less 1950s B-movie sci-fi and more David Cronenberg's Fly. And in both movies, it's up to the town's teenagers, whom are otherwise looked down upon by the older members of society, to stop the blob and put an end to its human dissolving ways. And in both movies, the blob's ultimate weakness is cold temperatures. So today, we are going to look into the most blobbiest movie villain of them all, as we look into 10 amazing facts about the blob. So, let's check it out. By the way, I'm only 17. Beware of the blob, it creeps and leaps and glides and slides across the floor and right through the door and all around the wall. A splotch, a blotch, be careful. Number 10, Blobfest. One, two, three o'clock, four o'clock, rock. Five, six, seven, On the account that the original Blob has become such a fan favourite and a monumental film in the realm of pop culture, every year a special event called Blobfest is held at the town of Phoenixville, Pennsylvania, where certain parts of the movie were filmed, including the ever-famous scene where a herd of terrified moviegoers frantically flee a movie theatre which gets taken over by the Blob. The three-day ceremony includes screenings of the Blob, a 1950s car show display, and even Steve McQueen look-alike competitions, in which I totally think Daniel Craig should enter. But the true cherry on top of the Blob Sunday, when it comes to Blobfest, is fans get to reenact the famous scene where terrified patrons flee the movie theatre, at the very theatre used for the movie. A small but interesting fact that I learned from the angry video game nerd. In fact, The Blob was such a popular movie at the time, even the movie's main funky theme made it to the Billboard charts. And, well, I guess you can't blame that for happening. After all, the song is pretty darn catchy. Beware of The Blob, it creeps and leaps and glides and slides across the floor. Number 9. The Blob is somewhat based on a true story. 
Okay, before you all go into a panic thinking the world is going to be taken over by a terrifying dissolving jelly monster, just calm down, as only certain elements are apparently based on a true story. You see, the Philadelphia Inquirer ran an article titled Flying Saucer Just Dissolves in 1950, in which two police officers claim to have seen a UFO fall from the sky, and when they approached the area of landing, all they were greeted with was a weird jelly-like substance. Supposedly, more officers were called to the site, where the jelly material simply dissolved before their eyes. The incident wasn't taken seriously by the nation, but one can only wonder if this triggered a spark in writers K. Linkerer and Theodore Simonson, and inspired them to write the blob. Number 8. The original blob was a Christian movie. Yeah, Christian movies aren't really known for their box office successes, and the blob hardly seems like the kind of subject matter you would see in a religious movie. On the account, it's about a rampaging, deadly alien life form. But indeed, when the blob went into production, the movie was funded by Valley Forge Films, which was a Christian movie company, which, although produced movies that were acclaimed, weren't doing too well financially. So making the blob was something of a gamble of the company to get financial stability. And, well, producing the blob clearly paid off. Because... Nothing says be good to your neighbour, along with other Christian values, quite like a blob monster absorbing you to death. Also, interestingly enough, in the movie's early days of production, the blob wasn't called the blob, but was in fact called the Molten Meteor. Huh. Yep, just rolls off the tongue, right? Along with the mass and the glob. Seriously? The glob? I don't think anyone is going to take the tagline, beware the glob, seriously. Number 7. Special Effects of the Blob The original blob creature in the 1958 movie takes on the appearance of being this weird jelly substance, no doubt designed after the article I mentioned before, making the blob quite possibly the most delicious looking movie monster of all time. The actual blob mass itself was made out of silicone and red dye. Simple, yet effective. However, jump to the 1988 remake, and the blob creature this time is much more complex. In the remake, the blob isn't a creature from out of space, but a man-made virus, which puts an interesting twist on the story. But unlike the original blob, which looks like dessert, I always find that the blob in the remake looks like a giant tumour. It's like a giant, vicious disease on the loose. Well, in this film, rather than just using silicon, the blob was created thanks to stop-motion animation and puppetry. Of which, for the most part, still actually holds up today. And let's face it, if the blob was remade today, it'll all just be CGI. Of which, there is apparently a new blob movie on the way. But, then again, they've been saying that for a few years now. Number 6. J.R. Made a Sequel When it comes to The Blob, most people are aware of the 1958 original and 1988 remake. But there was another entry in The Blob Saga. The lesser known Son of the Blob, also known as Beware the Blob, released in 1972 and directed by Larry Hagman, best known for his role as J.R. in the popular soap opera Dallas which earned the movie the title, The Movie J.R. Shot. Beware the Blob is something of a sequel to the original 1958 Blob, despite the fact that in the movie we actually see someone watching the original Blob on TV. So, yeah, I don't know how that works. And the movie feels very schlock. There is an emphasis on weird humour this time round. Like there is a scene where this bald man is taking a bath while he's wearing a fez, where the blob enters his bathroom, in which he tries to stop it by throwing a shoe at it. Yeah, that'll do it. We then get numerous shots of this guy running around naked, and it's like, please don't. Can you just not, please? Put some pants on. And there is also this weird subplot where we see some hippie 
try to get his hair cut by some snooty eccentric hairdresser in a really drawn out scene that feels like it goes on for ages with no rhyme or reason. It's just weird. Even Burgess Meredith is thrown in the mix for good measure. Then of course we get the title sequence where Hagman starts off this horror movie with some of the most terrifying footage you've ever seen. Yep, he starts the movie off with, um, uh, the most adorable cat you've ever seen wandering around a natural scenery. Wait, what? And the movie kind of looks a bit cheap and has a bit of a made-for-TV feel about it. But all said and done, it actually has some impressive moments. And even has a bowling alley scene which I think was trying to rival the cinema scene in the 1958 version. And dare I say it, it's actually very well done. I just wish the movie focused more on scares than weird humour. But if you're a fan of the blob, I say definitely check it out. Number 5. The remake has connections to the works of Stephen King. The 1988 Shockfest remake was co-written by Frank Darabont, whom actually has developed quite a few of Stephen King's works into films, including The Mist, The Green Mile, and Shawshank Redemption. So clearly the guy understands the horror novel maestro. However, there are lots of Stephen King references in the movie, particularly involving King's novel The Stand, in which both stories are about a deadly biological disease created as an experiment by the government, which accidentally gets unleashed onto the public. The main hero of the movie is a juvenile delinquent called Brian Flagg, a possible reference to The Stand's main villain, Randall Flagg. The homeless man who gets horrifically dissolved at the start of the movie is credited as Can Man. Once again, a possible reference to the character Trash Can Man from The Stand, whom is also seen as a dirty homeless social outsider. So yeah, with all these parallels, it's easy to connect the dots when it comes to The Stand and The Blob. But what really seals the deal is that the movie's main actress, Shawnee Smith, went on to have a role in the Stan TV miniseries adaptation, where she played an absolute crazy person. Yep, this is confirmed as far as I am concerned. The Stan and the Blob are really one and the same. And some of you modern horror fans may be delighted to know that Darabont also helped develop the Walking Dead TV series. Number four, a wheeler appears in the movie. In my Return to Oz episode, I spoke about just how creepy the dreaded wheelers are and how they had a scary impact on mine and many others' childhoods, probably needing many traumatised kids having to go to therapy. Well, if you are one of those terrified 80s kids, you need not worry. The blob totally has your back and gets even for you, as the actor who played the leader of the wheelers, Pon Ma, has a cameo in the movie. He plays the movie theatre owner who discovers the projectionist has been consumed by the blob before he gets attacked by the blob himself. Shit, yeah, take that! That'll teach you for scaring the crap out of me! In fact, the movie has a ton of celebrity cameos. It's like a who's who when it comes to pointing them out, as the movie also features Paul McCrane, one of the thugs from Robocop who is now a police deputy, which I find hilarious going from a cop killer to a cop himself. Candy Clark, who is best known for starring in movies such as American Graffiti and Stephen King's Cat's Eye, plays the owner of a local diner. Erica Alanake, who would go on to star in Baywatch and Under Siege, plays a potential date rape victim slash successful blob victim. Jameson Newlander, who played Alan Frog in The Lost Boys, plays a cinema usher. And even that guy from The Walking Dead is in the movie, starring as the Sheriff. And if all this wasn't enough, even a Razorhead makes a cameo. Yep, a Razorhead himself, Jack Nance, turns up in the film as a rather absent-minded doctor. The random list of cameos and small roles would have been complete if only they had Nicolas Cage or Christopher Walken, or both. 
I don't know. They could have been like government agents who were twins or something like that. Number three. The remake was going to have a sequel, but the plans were dropped. I wanna rock! In the 1988 version of The Blob, we meet an eerie, kind of creepy reverend called Reverend Mika. And after surviving a blob attack, the movie ends with Mika, now crazed and deformed, holding a sermon in what appears to be the middle of nowhere, where he preaches about the end of the world, where we learn that Mika has kept a tiny bit of the blob in a jar, and it's hinted that the now insane Mika is going to unleash the blob into society. Once again, believing that he would be doing God's work. But sadly, due to the poor box office performance of The Blob, the sequel was never made, leaving the end revelation kind of pointless and redundant. I think it's a shame because throughout the movie, we learn that the events taking place are all part of a more bigger picture, as we often see the Mika character explaining that this was prophesized, as if this was some kind of biblical end of days. I honestly would have loved to have seen that plot point furthered. And it kind of makes me wonder if the blob attack in the sequel would have had a larger scale and been grander. And would the movie have had a narrative that this was some kind of act of God? Oh well, we'll never know, but at least we'll always have the 1988 version of the blob with all its gory goodness. Number two, there is a horror movie within the movie. In the Blob remake, we learn about these two little shits who more off to go and see a horror movie, of which one of them describes as your basic slice and dice. And there are several moments in the movie where we cut back to this slasher movie that these two boys are watching. And I can't help but feel like this movie within the movie was making fun of the slasher genre. As we have a couple making out who are clearly 30 something playing teenagers. With a movie killer wearing a hockey mask like Jason Voorhees while wielding a chainsaw like Leatherface. And this segment also has ties to Freddy, somewhat, as the director of The Blob is Chuck Russell, whom just one year earlier had directed A Nightmare on Elm Street 3, The Dream Warriors, which, in my opinion, was the best Freddy sequel. But of course, the slasher film gets interrupted when the diseased pile of puke known as The Blob turns up to cause havoc Reminding everyone who the real villain of this movie is. Number one, the remake kills a kid. Okay, this might be slightly controversial, but I'm just going to say it. Kids in movies are freaking irritating. And very rarely do they come across as being good actors and not obnoxious and annoying. There, I've said it. Yeah, and I feel like with movies, we sort of have this, oh, think of the poor children attitude going on, and heaven forbid anything ever happening to the poor children. Well, the Blob remake is like, to hell with that. I don't discriminate. If a child gets in my way, I will kill that child. As in one scene where we see the main character, Meg, try to save her little brother and his friend from the blob by escaping via a sewer, we see the blob ruthlessly snatch the younger brother's friend, and, well, his death is one of the most horrific in the movie. I mean, look at that! The poor kid looks like the voodoo skull that Indiana Jones has to drink out of in Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. I think what makes this scene easier to watch is that this particular kid was set up as being obnoxious and unlikable. But regardless, this movie definitely has a lot of nerve and does something a lot of films don't do and says suffer the little children in a scene that you never would have seen in the original. Well guys, that was my protoplasmic look into the blob, or should I say the blobs. I enjoy both movies in their own unique ways. The original for its fun, carefree, B-movie ways, and the remake for its unapologetic lashings of gore. And I even get a bit of enjoyment out of the weird son of the blob. And if they ever do make a new version, I really hope they don't screw it up and make it all mediocre, without any charm and completely cramming it up with CGI. Like they always tend to do these days with movies. Anyway, I'm Minty, and beware the blob. See ya!